Hello, everyone. I'm excited to introduce Pranshu Bajpai. He'll be speaking about ransomware versus cryptojacking, latest trends in modern malware. Please give him a hearty round of applause. Welcome him. All right, let's get started. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, TourCon 20. This is my first time attending and speaking at TourCon, and it happened to be TourCon 20. So I'm very excited about that. 20 years of TourCon, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of hard work. So let's give the organizers a round of applause, right, for doing this for 20 years. It's, it's awesome. All right, so, um, so the topic of discussion today is, uh, you know, two of the biggest malware threats in, uh, in 2018, uh, ransomware and cryptojacking. We, we have we've all heard of them, and uh, we all know what ransomware do. We're very familiar with it, and now cryptojacking is rising. So these are the two biggest malware threats. And so we, we kind of want to look at the details of how they operate, what they're looking for, and what vulnerabilities lie in our systems that they're exploiting. So uh, we'll, keeping in, in, in tune with the theme of uh, TourCon this year, we'll, we'll look at the trends in terms of what is here to stay. So good trends that we've noticed in ransomware from a ransomware developer's perspective that they'll continue because it gives them certain advantages. So that's, and then we'll discuss crypto jacking. It's new. Where can we expect it to go? And uh, how can we stop it? All right, so, so the, the agenda for the talk is uh, we, we start with a little bit of an introduction and uh, we discuss ransomware a little bit, key management, uh, a particular hybrid key management model in ransomware. Then we go ahead and look at certain ransomware variants and what kind of specific characteristics make them different from a traditional ransomware. Those characteristics make them trendy and they, they continue because they're good for ransomware developers. And then from that point on, we'll move to crypto jacking. So the second half of the presentation will be focused on crypto jacking. And this is something new. Some of, then we'll show, discuss some of the uh, research we did on the, on, uh, to crawl the web looking for crypto jacking websites and notice what, uh, and uh, discuss what we noticed in terms of crypto jacking on the internet. And then we'll conclude the presentation with kind of a comparison between the two because they're both contenders for the top malware threat, but which one is going to win? So we'll, we'll take a look at that in conclusion. All right, so a little bit about us. Uh, my name is Pranshu Bajpai. I'm a PhD candidate at Michigan State University. Uh, I'm also a security researcher at the Security Research Group uh, at MSU. And uh, previously, I worked, used to work as an ind independent penetration tester. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, breaking things is always a lot of fun. I, I'm sure everybody here agrees. And then um, uh, I like to speak at conferences just to, if, if I've done some work that I believe uh, could be valuable to the community, then I like to share it. And uh, sometimes when I'm in the middle of doing something, I, I, th I, I like to think that I can get some input from the community to kind of improve uh, my approaches. And in that, you know, in that sense, I like to also share it with the, with the community at conferences. All the work that I do, I do it with my PhD advisor, Dr. Enbody. Uh, he has been a professor at Michigan, State's, uh, Michigan State since 1987, I believe. All right, so I felt like uh, there's a little bit of a need to, to discuss uh, uh, why we're discussing ransomware in, uh, in 2018. Because uh, believe it or not, something that is a very 2017 thing, right, or 2016 thing. Well, the truth is that ransomware is overshadowed currently by cryptojacking, but is not really uh, gone. And it is slowly developing, and you know, they're improving, uh, improving ransomware constantly. And so uh, we have to watch out for that. Uh, but we don't see it in the news anymore. I mean, we do see it, but it's buried within other security news, and crypto jacking is kind of all over the place because it's new. Uh, but this is, these are just uh, some of the, if you, if, you, if you look at the news headlines from, let's say, last week, you'll, you'll, look, at, uh, you know, uh, you'll look at how ransomware is rising, spe specifically targeted ransomware, and how they're uh, constantly adapting and improving uh, their approaches. And uh, you know you see new victims all the time. Like uh, just a few days ago, a Canadian town was hit. So they're they're constantly going for uh, newer targets. Uh, we we know, know about Sam Sam, uh, which is a targeted ransomware attack. And so yeah, they're definitely improving, uh, and they're definitely still here. They're definitely alive and kicking. So. Uh, 
I want to establish what the dis defining characteristics of a ransomware uh, are, and these are very straightforward. We all understand it. You know, infiltrate the computer system uh, or any system any way you can. Uh, you can. There are a variety of attack vectors here. You can. Uh, you can uh, use the same old social engineering attacks that they've been using for many years. Or, you know, uh, with, with WannaCry, we saw it spread like a worm, uh, you know, exploiting the eternal blue uh, vulnerability. And then we, we saw that uh, Sam Sam recently is, uh, using, uh, weak, uh, is abusing weekly secured RDP sessions to, to get, into the, get into the host. And once you're in, you know, you, you go ahead and, you know, uh, execute your malicious functionality. So, uh, so once you're in, uh, you obtain the encryption secret. And uh, this is important because the encryption secret or the symmetric key that they will use to encrypt the user's files or data needs to, needs to be generated for, uh, differently for every uh, victim. Because if you use the same encryption key to encrypt every victim, once one victim gets an encryption key back, they can share it with other people. And you know, before you know it, your ransomware campaign is neutralized. So they need a new encryption secret for every victim. And there comes key management in ransomware, which we'll discuss in the next slide. But uh, they can either generate this symmetric key or set of symmetric keys, whatever their scheme is. They can either generate it on the host using the host's crypto API. Or they can, they, what, they, what they used to do was uh, invoke it from, let's say, a, a remote site, like, you know, which could be like a command and control server. So, uh, so you know, the, these are the two approaches uh, that we've, we've primarily seen. There's variations to these approaches, but uh, these are basically it to uh, acquire the encryption secret. Then they go ahead and encrypt the files using the encryption secret or the or the file or the symmetric key, and uh, and then they demand the ransom. So there has to be a, some sort of a, a channel, a route for the ransom payment to be made. You know, uh, and you know, usually it's via Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency. But how does this uh, work exactly? So. We have the uh, hybrid encryption model. Uh, we've studied the evolution of uh, key management in, uh, in ransomware, and we've discussed it in detail in our paper uh, listed on the slide. And, uh, and if you look at it uh, over the years since GP code first came out in about 2005 or 2006, I believe, uh, since then they have changed their uh, key management model significantly. What it used to be was they were doing something really dumb, which was uh, they just they generated the attacker generated a public private key pair and they would ship the public key with the ransomware and use the public key to encrypt the data. Now that is very slow. Public key public keys were not meant for bulk data encryption. Symmetric keys are more uh, more of uh, you know, were more made for for that particular purpose. So so that was a little stupid. But you know then they had some other stupid variations of that uh, and then started to evolve. And then what we saw was they were trying to import. So once the ransomware was in a host, then it would call back home to a CNC server, let's say, and get the set of keys that it needs. Then the, it brings in the set of keys, and then it uses those keys to encrypt the files. But the problem there was that security people, uh, you know, in, in a network, they, they, network administrators, they started sharing a list of bad domain names where they know that the CNC servers lie. Uh, so then you block them at the firewall, at the network firewall. Now the ransomware is in, let's say, but it's still, when it calls back home, that call is blocked. So it never acquires the encryption key. And because it never acquires the encryption key, it cannot go ahead and encrypt the files, and then it lies dormant. So, so that wasn't a good model either. Uh, I believe it was Loki that, that implemented that model. But, uh, but what they're using, more importantly, what they're using now is what we want to discuss is the hybrid encryption scheme. And so the hybrid encry encryption scheme is called uh, a hybrid scheme because it uses the combination of symmetric and asymmetric encryption, which is best for them because in this particular approach, as you can see, uh, the, attacker, uh, the, the attacker has the private key, uh, public, uh, private public key pair and keeps the private key safe with them. Then the public key is shipped with the ransomware. The ransomware comes in, uses the crypto API on host to generate a symmetric key. The symmetric key is used for encrypting users' files, and then encrypt the symmetric key using the attacker's public key, and then store it. And now you wipe the unencrypted symmetric key from the system, and then you go ahead and demand ransom. If the ransom is paid, and if you're, if you've, if you're honest criminals, then you're going to return, uh, you're going to ask for this encrypted symmetric key, and use your private key to decrypt the keys and then send it back to the victim. So that's basically how the hybrid encryption model works. Uh, there, there's variations of this, but uh, primarily that's what they do. 
So with that, let's quickly uh, start looking at the trends in, in, in modern, mo uh, modern ransomware. So first things first, targeted ransomware attacks are here, and they're here to stay. Uh, it makes more sense uh, to, to pick your victims carefully, because it, there could be several factors why you're picking your victims. One, one, of them you want, uh, one of them you want to make sure that they have deep enough pockets to make a big ransom de meet a big ransom demand. Like if you encrypt a bunch of computers belonging to a network in a, a large organization, then they should have pockets deep enough to pay you, let's say, $50,000 or $100,000 or whatever your demand might be. So it makes sense uh, that way. Second, the data should be important enough. Some organizations have really critical data. And, uh, and so they are more likely to meet your ransom demand, no matter how big it is. So, so in that sense, you want to choose your victims carefully. And, uh, and Sam Sam did this, uh, and uh, the way it worked was, you know, the attack vector was weekly secured RDP uh, session. So, you know, it will go ahead and exploit that. Once they're in, uh, they will manually escalate privileges. And uh, when, you be when you become, let's say, an administrator, then you kill the AV, and then you spread and infect, and then you demand the ransom. Uh, now they have made uh, about six million so far, uh, and um, you know you, you make six million dollars from your ransomware operation. You take out one million dollars for sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and you still have, you know, five million for your next ransomware campaign uh, as a research budget. You know, so it's, it's a substantial amount of money. That the address shown is one of the Bitcoin addresses that belong to uh, the the Sam Sam ransomware. So, so that's, that's one of the things, you know, targeted ransomware attacks are here to say. Uh, now, uh, you know, adding a miner, cryptocurrency is on the rise. The second half of the presentation is about that, and we'll discuss, uh, you know, exactly what it entails. But we all know that it's on the rise, so why wouldn't they include another secondary, uh, you know, infection in there? You know, add a, add a crypto miner. Um, and, uh, you know, so they are bundling mining routines with the ransomware. We saw it a little while ago with Black Ruby ransomware. We're seeing it lately with uh, where, uh, uh, ransomware like the blue blackmail virus or the Obama-themed virus, as it is called. And, uh, and, uh, and so we're seeing that they are bundling mining, mining routines with the ransomware. And there's, there's a lot of motivation for why they would do this. First, first of all, it runs in the background while you're waiting for, for ransom. You know, it's like... It, it will generate some small income for you. Even if the victim doesn't end up paying you ransom, you still end up generating a little bit of something if financially, if you're like completely financially motivated, so it makes sense. And then uh, it's favorable to ransomware developers in the context of developing countries, especially because you, know, you, 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 take, uh, you ask for $300 of, uh, you know, after, uh, as, a, as a ransom demand, and uh, if it's a country like India, let's say, where the exchange rate is $1 converts to about 70 Indian rupees, then uh, you convert that to rupees, and $300 is a lot of money. So you're not really going to get a lot of people paying you the ransom, even though they don't want to lose their files at times, unless it's business critical files, and in that case, they might end up paying. But otherwise, you know, if it's personal files, they'll they'll be like, all right, I'll, I'll deal with the I'll deal with the loss. I don't want to pay this kind of money. So in that case, it makes more sense if you if you can detect the IP address of the host you've infected, resolve that to a country, and see that say that if this is the list of countries, you know, it's a developing country. Then in that case, just just mine in the background, you know, lie, let the ransomware functionality lie dormant. So. So that's, that, that could be a thing uh, in, in the future. We've already seen them resolve the IP addresses to countries, but they've usually done it to, let's say, if it's a, if it's a Russian malware, then it will, and if it detects a Russian host that it is infected, then it won't encrypt. Uh, there's, there could be a bunch of reasons for why they do this. Maybe it's uh, some sort of patriotism, or maybe it's because the authorities, local authorities, are more likely to get to you. So we saw it, saw it with some uh, ransomware in Iran as well, where it was detecting Iran's IP and then not uh, executing the malicious functionality. So, so, uh, so it makes sense for them to do it in case of uh, cryptocurrency uh, mining as well. Um, and so, yeah, something is better than nothing. You at least generate some income. And then, uh, and another thing we're noticing with ransomware is, uh, the, you know, they, they started using elliptic curve cryptography. The Petya ransomware used it, uh, the infamous Petya ransomware. And, and, and the motivation, now there's, this is, these are just speculations because we don't exactly know why they need to use the elliptic curve cryptography cryptography because RSA does the job just fine. Uh, RSA 2048 bit encryption is strong enough. They don't really need to use this, but it could be uh, better for marketing uh, in the underground economy because underground markets can be competitive just like any other uh, you know, uh, business. And so, 
So it's better for marketing to look at us. We're using the new and shiny elliptic curve cryptography as opposed to our competitors who are using the same old RSA you've always heard of. So, and then, and this is another speculation. It's not as closely scrutinized as RSA is for, for security weaknesses. So if you make a mistake, you're more likely to get away with it, uh, you know, in, in terms of implementation. So, so that could be another reason. But, but basically, uh, I wanted to discuss the example of uh, Petya ransomware and see how they implemented the ECIES scheme, as it is called, the uh, Elliptic Curve in Integration Encryption Scheme uh, in, in, in the ransomware. So, so that uh, SCP-192K1, I'm sure there's a better way of saying that, but that, what you see is, is, the, is the curve uh, deployed in Petya ransomware. The curve has certain parameters, so the domain parameters of a curve uh, is, for example, the base point, which is shown, uh, just as an example. And so the domain parameters and the public key uh, ship with the ransomware. And then the secret integer, so this is a, this is the same thing as you know, the public key cryptography, you know, the secret integer uh, S will be kept safe with the attacker. Wanted to quickly discuss how ECIES works. This is the only slide with, with, with math in there. Uh, it's quite a risk I took right here. But, uh, but you, know, you generate a random integer T. This is a very simplified version of understanding how elliptic curve cryptography works in the context of ransomware. Uh, so upon infection, you generate a random integer T on the host. And that for, for, do, for, for doing that, you can use the crypt gen random function uh, that is part of the Windows Crypto API uh, or the dev u random on Linux, if you're on Linux. But anyway, you generate the random integer T. And then you get Q by combining T with G. So G was the base point from the previous slide, if you don't remember that. And that's part of the domain parameters. That's public. That's part of the curve. Uh, so, so then the ransomware combines it to get Q. And then once you have Q, you, you take the T and P, combine it, perform a hash of it, and you get the H, which is the encryption key. So the P over here uh, is, is the attacker's public key that was embedded in the ransomware, shipped with it. And so now you get the encryption key. Now you encrypt using the encryption key. And then you, you go ahead, and it's important to execute this step. Uh, if they make a mistake, then that's why we are there to exploit it uh, and you know, making a decryptor available on a project like no, no More Ransom. So you purge T and H from host. This is important for the ransomware developer to do. Uh, and then upon receiving payment, uh, and then you demand the ransom. And then you know, if, if you receive payment, then what you can do is ask for Q. And because you have that secret integer, and it, it has this property, this important mathematical property that it can combine with Q to give the same, same result as combining T with the attacker's public key gave us. Uh, so basically, they can get the encryption key back using the secret integer that, they, that never left them and that they have. And so, so now they're able to generate the symmetric key back on their system. And then they can just send that back to you uh, as your decryption key. And then you can, um, you can decrypt your data. So that's that's that's. A simplified version of how ECIES works on, on a ransomware like, uh, you know, the Petya ransomware. So uh, we may see more of elliptic curve cryptography as they begin to move away from RSA for whatever reason. And uh, all right, so then, so then we have uh, purging backups. This is, a, this is a trend that started a few years ago, and, you know, and, and it makes sense for them to do. The only leverage that ransomware developers have over their victims is uh, denial of data, basically. They're, they're disallowing you access to your data. So if you can get it packed, then uh, you know you know that uh, uh, basically backups are the ultimate defense against ransomware. So backups can exist in many forms. You can have it on a mapped network drive, or you can you can you know in, on a host in terms of uh, Windows uh, you know volume shadow copies, or you can have, if you trust cloud storage providers, then with your critical data, then you can uh, upload you know with your sensitive data, then you can upload them on on cloud providers as well. Uh, now ransomware are known to explicitly search for and encrypt network shares and uh, purge VSS files on host. And sometimes they're even known to abuse the same clients of these cloud service providers to encrypt files stored on the cloud. Also, uh, if, if, if it's an automatic sync up that's happening, if the ransomware ends up encrypting your files and you've got it to, if you've set it up to automatically sync to the cloud, the cloud copies will also get encrypted. But of course, uh, you know, with I, I believe OneDrive is providing a functionality where it lets you revert back changes for up to a month and so you know you can kind of get your files back from there but but uh, but yeah there, so you know if you perform a dynamic analysis of various ransomware and you know this this exists in many ransomware and that's here to stay but if you if you perform a dynamic analysis of let's say for example Sam Sam you'll see that you know it uses the vsadmin.exe uh, on Windows to, to delete 
to quietly delete all shadow copies. And, uh, and that's why it's suggested that you rename VSS admin on Windows. And there's a little bit of a workaround there uh, so, that, uh, you know, so that your volume shadow, shadow copies keep on you know, uh, producing and syncing. But, uh, but, but basically, you want to rename it because ransomware love to use that uh, to uh, remove, to quietly purge all of your uh, shadow copies. Um, and then we've, we're also, we've also seen that they like to explicitly map network shares. And then once they're mapped on your host, then they will go infect that there and then uh, you know, encrypt that as well. So what they use for that is uh, a standard Windows function like uh, w, uh, w add connect, WNet add connection, which is used to map the network shares. So uh, we've seen a lot of that during static analysis as well. Um, so the so next trend I wanted to quickly talk about was, uh, was dropping spyware. And, uh, and so this is an example, this is an excerpt of code taken from the RAA ransomware, which was one of a kind ransomware because it was based entirely on JavaScript. And, uh, and so they can't really do much in terms of uh, hiding their code, but they can definitely do code obfuscation. So what they do is they give the functions random strings as names, and you know, uh, so it's, it's really hard to follow. They try to jumble things up, so it's basically every bad coding practice that they can do, that they do it in there so that it makes it hard for you to read the and analyze the code. So some code obfuscation there as part of this JavaScript ransomware. But this particular function is important because uh, this is the one that drops the, the pony spyware on, on a user's machine once it's done infecting the machine. So, so it, it, it's a, it's a self-decrypting code. So it, it, it decrypts a part of itself in and if you uh, so so this code in the in the beginning decrypts to to here uh, and uh, and what what you can see over there is they're trying to put st.exe which is the pony uh, pony uh, spyware in your my documents folder and then execute it from there so that it it's not not just encrypting your files but is also stealing your passwords and uh, in other kinds of information uh, on on the host so. Uh, now this, they, they wouldn't, it, there's not a lot of motivation for them to do it except for the obvious benefit of, you know, stealing your personal info as well. But, you know, it, it's, it makes us distrust, makes the average victim distrust ransomware operators and developers so they're not likely to pay if they know that, uh, you know, there's, they, they can be trusted. They won't just give you your key back but will leave some secondary infection in there. So they really like to make sure that their victims trust them in a, in a, in a sense, you know, but, but doing these kind of practices is actually bad for, for business, but then there's all kind of ransomware developers in the underground industry, and so, you know, while some of them will avoid doing this, some of them will do these kind of things, you know, adding a minor ad, dropping spyware, and so on. So if you perform the dynamic analysis in case of the RAA sample.js as, as shown over here, uh, you'll see that it, it opens wordpad.exe and puts uh, a document in front of you with uh, random text in it, and while you're trying to figure out what's going on in the background, it, it executes and drops the st.exe uh, st as the pony spyware, and, uh, and, that, and then it executes it so that now you've got a spyware on your system in addition to the ransomware. So the attack vectors, uh, uh, you know, uh, Attack vectors are constantly evolving. They'll, they like to get into the system any way that they can, but, but they used to go mostly for the social engineering attacks where they're you know, attacking, uh, where they're sending an email to an unsuspecting victim, trying to get them, trick them into downloading and executing the threat. You know, uh, RAA.js was, RAA ransomware was a JavaScript-based ransomware, and I believe a, a mo major motivation behind writing a ransomware in JavaScript could be other than the fact that the ransomware developer was very familiar with JavaScript and wanted to use it, could be that they wanted to send a, a, an email attachment that says ra. you know whatever dot js, and the and the and an average user is more is, is likely to think that you know it's not an exe, it's not DLL, it looks like I can you know download and execute it. So you know to throw them you know uh, off their off their sense. So in in this case, you know so so they, they they do try new social engineering tricks like that over the years, and they've tried that, but. That has been the predominant attack vector, but why WannaCry made big news uh, when it came out in, I believe, 2015 was because of the way it spread. There was nothing very special about WannaCry except for it spread like a worm and exploited this uh, vulnerability. Uh, and, uh, and because of that, uh, it made major news. So they had shifted their attack vector uh, in, in, in that case. And then, uh, and then in case of SamSam, -Sam, recently uh, in 2018, it's been, like I mentioned before, it's been exploiting 
uh, RDP sessions or remote, uh, you know, remote connections. So, so there's more to come, and uh, you know, as, as part of the as as part of security, uh, as part of the security group, it's, it's our responsibility to kind of think a step ahead and think about what other attack vectors they might exploit, you know, uh, and, and try to close them down before they get attacked. So. Um, so that's something to think about. Uh, WannaCry, we've all seen this PCAP of WannaCry. I wanted to quickly show it. You know, it, it, as, soon as, it as soon as you analyze it, you notice that uh, after infection, it, it starts looking for, scanning for port 445 on different hosts uh, to see if it can exploit the SMB vulnerability. And yeah, so that's spreading like a worm. All right, so, so with that, we're, we're done with like, the first part of the presentation, which discusses ransomware and the trends that, that's here to stay in ransomware and that we've noticed over the years. But uh, what we want to talk about now is, uh, is a new thing, of course, cryptojacking. We, we all know what, what it is, uh, but I wanted to go into a little bit of a detail about how they're, how they're executing this. So, so one evening, me and my advisor we were having a conversation about malware threats and, and basically cryptojacking and ransomware. And he said, well, you know, if you think about it, Bitcoin made ransomware possible. Uh, because, you know, so, so I believe the first ransomware that came out was in 1989. And it was called the AIDS Trojan. It, it, it did some kind of jumbling up of files. I'm, I'm not really sure what it did because it's, it was a while ago. And, 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 uh, and what it did in terms of ransom payment was ask you to make a payment deposit in a, in a PO box in Panama. Now, that, that doesn't you know, take you far in, if you're looking to develop this as an, as an underground industry. But with the rise of cryptocurrency, especially with Bitcoin, made it easy to set up a, uh, an online anonymous mode of payment. And so, and so then, you know, ransomware took off after that. So it, it's kind of related. In the absolute sense, it doesn't have to, you know, it's not like Bitcoin did make ransomware, but, you know, if you think about it, it did. So, and then and so I, I thought, okay, well, in that case, Monero made cryptojacking because, uh, you know, uh, with, you, you can't infect a user's, an average user's computer with a crypto, cryptojacking malware and mine, try to mine Bitcoin on there because Bitcoin requires specialized hardware, it requires mining rigs. So it's just not very feasible unless you're doing it in really, really large numbers or something. It, it's just not feasible to mine Bitcoin in an average user's computer. And an average user's computer doesn't have those, uh, you know, graphics processing units and all of those, you know, miners that are required for the, 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 the hardware that is required for mining Bitcoin. But Monero, on the other hand, the algorithms are designed for an average user's CPU, like an i5 or an i7 processor that you know almost every computer these days has. So, so for that, uh, you know, because of that, Monero took off, and then with Monero, cryptojacking took off, spe especially the web-based cryptojacking. There were some other factors in there, like coin hype came into existence and things like that. But yeah, uh, so cryptojacking took off when Monero took off. All right, so. You know, a little bit about cryptojacking. It's also known as drive-by mining. Uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's, it's stealing someone's processing power to mine cryptocurrency. Uh, and uh, it's an offshoot of the valuation, rise in valuation of uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, when Bitcoin took off, it, uh, you know, it, when it rose, uh, it brought some of the other cryptocurrencies values with it. And then, you know, now we've got cryptojacking. Uh, there's a general lack of awareness among the average computer users about what cryptojacking is. So as part of some of our efforts, we wrote some media articles to make the, make the people aware about the problem. And then we did a radio interview where the questions that were coming from the average people, it, it was very clear that it's not always easy for an average computer user to understand what cryptojacking is right away. Uh, because they, have to st they started all the way from blockchain, asking me questions about blockchain, and that, uh, that was not easy to answer. So, uh, so, so they're, they're preying on the general lack of awareness, you know, uh, and then uh, it's easy to pull off. Uh, you don't even have to be really a hacker of any sort to, to do this because all, all you need to do is have a website with a decent number of visitors visiting you, uh, if you think about it, and then you can just include four lines of JavaScript code in your website's HTML, and then, you know, you've got, you've got a cryptojacking, uh, you know, a platform ready. And, uh, and, and that, that's where CoinHive and CryptoLoot and CoinImp and services like that come into the picture. So you don't need specialized hardware anymore. That's another thing. You know, like, like I said with Monero, there's no need for specialized hardware. An average CPU is fine. So the, the problem with crypto jacking, again, explaining it to the average user, you know, what, what's, the, what's the problem? So why is it hurting me? You know? uh, so other than slowing my computer down and 
making noise, you know, and that sort of thing. So, so the immediate problem is, of course, you know, processing, increased processing uh, requires more electrical power, so it's more costly. You do, that, do this at an organizational level. Now the organization is using a lot of money because a lot of the employees are in infected, uh, their stations are infected with, uh, you know, cryptojacking malware or uh, so, you, you, so you lose, uh, you know, the, the cost of electrical power is the immediate problem. Long-term con concern is electromigration. If you use a CPU or, you know, high heat for a long period of time, theoretically, electromigration is possible that damages the CPU, but the truth of the matter is that we change laptops, and so the recycling time of rap laptops are, is so short these days uh, that it's more likely that you'll change the laptop by the time that your CPU burns out, except for some extreme cases where, uh, where I, I just heard about this case recently, two days ago, where someone's processor uh, caught fire because uh, one of the clients, of a, uh, one of the clients, so basically an employee in a corporate network, uh, had asked for this really, uh, really uh, powerful computer uh, for work, apparently. But what they were doing was was mining uh, cryptocurrency on it 24/7. Uh, ended up catching fire, um, but. <laughs> That's, that's, not really, uh, that's not really what we're concerned about, because one thing, if you think about it, with the next wave of cryptojacking criminals coming into the picture, as I'll talk about in later slides, they will be smarter. And you don't, if you're a smart cyber criminal, cryptojacking people, you don't want to kill the cash cow. So turning your, you know, you know killing the host is not something a virus intends to do, at least not right away, at least not in the case of cryptojacking when a long-term you know, mining could give you substantial funds. So, so that's not really a concern right now. So, so types of cryptojacking, you know, there's, there's several types. From, from what we have noticed on the internet, we've, we've kind of condensed it to this. Uh, you know, you can install a mining application on host. Uh, and in that case, there's two ways of doing that. You either trick the user into installing one. So it's the same old social engineering tactics that I was talking about earlier. So either you can, you know, have a user download this and execute it. Or you can exploit a vulnerability and spread like, you know, it, like the Redis Wana mine did, and it exploited the same internal blue vulnerability, but instead of a ransomware, it was a, it was a mining malware. So, so, so you can do that as well. And now, and then the other one, uh, other wave of attacks in terms of cryptojacking that we've been seeing are the JavaScript-based miners, and we, we all know about these ones. You know, just lure victims to a web page, and, and the web page runs an embedded JavaScript miner, so as long as the victim or the visitor stays on the web page, it keeps on mining. We've also seen instances where if you try to close the page, it act actually doesn't let you close it. It actually pops a window uh, in the, in the, and hides it behind the, the time uh, on the taskbar and in a way that you can barely see it. So the window is small and it's kind of open and you think that it's not, but it, it, the, the point of keeping the window open is that it keeps mining. So, so we've, we've seen them do this. Um, and, uh, and then uh, they inject mining. Another way to do it is to inject mining scripts into ad networks. And we've seen several examples of this where legitimate websites, even Goldman websites, are serving uh, ad ads to their visitors, uh, hundreds of thousands of visitors. Uh, and, and the ads are infected with the cryptojacking scripts. And so uh, you know, they, they, they're all unwillingly participating in this cryptojacking campaign. So we've seen a lot of examples of that as well. So, so those are the two, uh, you know, rough, uh, roughly the, the two ways of doing the, the, the cryptojacking attacks. So with that, we, we, we kind of want to move forward and discuss the, uh, the cryptojacking on the web, some of the, some of the preliminary analysis that we've done uh, to, to identify uh, what's going on. And, uh, and an example of a JavaScript-based uh, mining script uh, is, looks something like this. Uh, uh, so both of them are examples of uh, CoinHive scripts uh, embedded in, in, in a, in a web page that, that we visited, and they are not notifying. So cryptocurrency mining in itself, as we all know, is not inherently bad or you know, uh, illegal. It's, if they ask for your permission, like in the case of Salon, you know, if, if they ask for your permission and you say, I don't want to see the ads, in fact, what I want to do is I'll let you mine for a little bit, but just don't show me the ads. And so if you agree to that as a user, then that's fine, you know. But in these cases, uh, they were not doing that. They were, there was no notification given to the user, so then it becomes cryptojacking. And so these were two examples where, you know, all they need to do is just import, import the CoinHive script, the, the JS script, and... Uh, and then the, and the next set of uh, commands uh, are basically to initiate the, uh, the mining activity. And the, the, the long string that you see in the, in the boxes, uh, those strings uh, correspond to where to make the, 
make the payments. So, uh, you know, who, sh who should the proceeds of the crypto jacking or the cryptocurrency mining go to? Of course, that's the attacker's address. And, and so your computer does the mining and, you know, they get the profit. So the idea is clear. Uh, so that's another example of a JavaScript-based mining script, ex except for in this case, it's crypto loot. It's not CoinHive. I wanted to put that on there because it's, CoinHive has become almost synonymous with uh, JavaScript-based uh, uh, mining on the web. And it is the most predominant one used, but there's other options available like Crypto Loot and uh, CoinImp and so on. There's a bunch of them available. The point is that when we're doing research, we don't just want to be looking for CoinHive. There's other things as well. So that's why I wanted to show this example as well. Um, now, impact on system resources. This is a, small, a simple study done uh, by us which, where, where we just we loaded. A, this, is a, this, this is a before and after shot of, a, of resources on a Kali Linux box. And, uh, and you know, as, uh, before, you know, the cores were barely, barely doing anything, uh, but, uh, and the temperature was down. And then uh, after we opened this web page on Firefox, which was, uh, which was a crypto jacking web page, uh, the resource consumption shot up to 100% right away. All four cores are being used to full capacity. The temperature is rising. This screenshot was taken immediately after it. And so within, uh, within a few seconds, the temperature started rising right away. And uh, if you look at the processes, so the, so the, so the CPU were, CPUs were utilized all four cores. And then, and then the proce if you look at the processes, the web content uh, over there with PID 3719 is, is taking 97.5% of CPU. Which, you know, if you think about it, that's not smart of them to do because it's easier to notice something like this as opposed to if they were only mining 40%, but would go lo that would go long term. So that's what our concern is right now is that they will get smarter because they're doing trial and fa failure right now, trial and error. Uh, with time, they'll get smarter. And then, uh, you know, they will only load your CPU so that, you know, it, it doesn't you know, make a lot of noise, you know, it doesn't lag, so that it's, it's more of a chance for them to keep mining for, for the long term. So, so that's a real concern. Uh, so, so cryptojacking on the internet, uh, preliminary analysis. Now, this is, uh, there's some complications in doing this study that I will discuss. Uh, basically, we, we want to crawl the web looking for unauthorized coin hive miners. That was our goal. Uh, how do we do this? Now, you know, looking, mass crawling the, uh, the web with, so many different kind of websites and web domains, that's not easy. And we're not just trying to look at the URL or something, we're, lo we're looking at the source code of the web page to determine if there's a, if there's a coin hive or some other kind of uh, cryptocurrency mining script on there. If we do recognize the presence of one, which is not very easy to do, if, even if you do that, then we have to make sure that it's not a legitimate website uh, which is asking for permission. Uh, but it is actually crypto jacking, so it's covertly mining. So that's another another tricky part. So so for crawling the web, instead of writing our own tool right now, well, there's some services already available. Like public www is a is a service that lets you. It's it's the search engine for source code of websites. So that's exactly what we need. We want to look at the source code of websites to see if there's any embedded miners on there. So that's one way to do it. And then Nerdy Data and uh, Census.io they, they 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 provide similar functionality. So that's where. We, we, we looked, and uh, so how do we determine the unauthorized part? That's very tricky because, and that's what slows down the pace of this research because uh, once you identify that, let's say, so many web pages on the internet are, are deploying these crypto jacking uh, mi cryptocurrency miners, how do you determine that they are not asking for permission without manually looking at the web page? And, uh, and, and seeing if they, if they some, somewhere through the notice saying that, uh, you know, oh, by the way, if you're here, we're mining, you know. Uh, so so that's, that makes it a manual process, which makes it slow. Um, so how do we validate the results? That's another big question. Some websites uh, are now unavailable. So, so when they were cached by these services, they, you know, and they gave us a list of which domains are having, you know, have employed these scripts, uh, now the websites are down and unavailable because these tend to be, you know, uh, uh, shady websites in the first place, and now they're unavailable, so, you know. And then some websites have not cleaned the source code, so now you, if, you go, if you go there, the, 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 the source code doesn't really show any scripts, so maybe they were unwillingly participating in this crypto jacking, and so they have now removed the, removed the mining scripts. So another big question is how do we get around code obfuscation? So an example of code obfuscation is, is this. Where so this is this was uh, the continuation. It's an excerpt from the from the HTML of the of the web page, and uh, if you look at that part right there, that's that's an obfuscation in the form of the traditional you know Java JavaScript eval function. So they have packed 
the actual uh, coin hive mining script code into uh, into the, the eval part right there so if you look at it uh, this was the obfuscation part in the first box uh, and this was what was part of the of the of the website now the problem is that if you're using a crawler to crawl looking for let's say coinhive.min.js in quotes exactly as it is or something like that then because this that particular string would not be found in the source code because of the obfuscation done here, then you're going to miss out on this particular kind of uh, obfuscation in your analysis. So, and that second box uh, is what it, uh, uh, if you de-obfuscate it, then that is what uh, it actually is. It's the same old thing that we've seen before. It's, uh, it's just a coin hive miner. So that makes it more tricky. All right, now this, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to put this, that's a typical example of a, of a website uh, mining. I, I censored it, and then I censored it again for, for the sake of our sanity. Uh, you know, uh, so if you, if you really look at, 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 this, at the picture in my, uh, the file in my, in, on, in my, on my box, it's like, you know, poopy girl censored underscore censored again, you know. Uh, so, so that's a typical example of a website that, 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 that's doing this on the, on the Internet. And I'll discuss why streaming content is such a good platform for them to do this. Uh, but uh, you know, f you know, looking at this website, you know, forgive me for for you know questioning the no doubt pristine reputation of Poopy Girls, but I, I think they're crypto jacking their visitors, you know, because uh, I didn't see any notice about you know mining, and you know, so so we identified because of our crawl that we did. Actually, because of this crawl, uh, the results we got from the, these crawling services, we wrote some queries to see where the coin hive and coin imp and crypto loot and all of these JavaScript based miners are hidden. We identified 212 websites. Now, that's, all, that's not a lot, of, a lot of websites compared to how many there really are. But like I said, the process is slow. And so that's why, if, if you've got any ideas on how we can you know, uh, you know, make it faster, then I would love to hear it. But right now, we've identified 212 websites. That are involved in crypto jacking, and uh, we want to resolve these websites to categories because we want to see what kind of websites are doing this. What's what's the trend here, right? So, uh, are the are these pornography websites that are basically involved in this, or are these malicious websites that are also serving other malicious content? Are they involved in piracy, distributing pirated software and games? So, but how do we do this? Uh, we can't just look at each domain and try to un understand what's about. So, we use the Forty Guard web categories for this. Forty Guard uh, provides you a way to. Uh, Resolve a domain name to uh, to uh, to what kind of website it is because they, they they do it so as a as a network administrator you can block people from going to let's say pornographic websites on your network and so that's the purpose of it and so so uh, basically we use the FortiGuard to resolve these two, two categories we wrote a simple Python script it w as with any kind of web scraping you want to be nice if you're doing something uh, like this and so you you make it sleep for a, a, an amount of time so that you don't overwhelm their server with a lot of requests and if you're making a lot of requests in our case we didn't make a, a, a lot of requests uh, but if you're making a lot of requests then it just makes sense for you to just buy the API so just play nice if you're if you're doing the web scraping and then from 40 guard we, we got it resolved to categories writing a simple script and we noticed that you know 40 guard came up with these so according to the websites we identified that were involved in crypto jacking it came up with these were the kind of websites that were that were involved in there the malicious websites were number one so they were already involved in other kinds of you know drive-by attacks and then uh, streaming media and download is right up there and pornography is right up there so so that's uh, that's part of the analysis, and then uh, if you look at the geographic distribution based on where the IP addresses are lie, they're they're all over Europe and some in U U.S. We noticed some in, in in Russia and 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 so on. Um, again, this needs to be more. We need more data because the process is slow. Uh, we need to we need more data to get more results about the statistics that we're interested in knowing about these crypto jacking websites. Uh, because then we can warn users about where not to go, what not to do, and that's and so on. So, 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 some of the things that we saw right away after this analysis was, uh, as we expected, crypto jacking websites are involved in other dubious practices. You know, they're already distributing malware or illegal videos, like you know, come watch Game of Thrones latest episode, you know, in HD quality and that sort of thing. And then they're also distributing malware and and and, and these things. Now, streaming media websites make it, them ideal for cryptocurrency mining, and I don't mean things like Netflix or YouTube. I mean more of 
like where can I watch Game of Thrones or something like that online for free? Where can I watch free pornographic content in HD quality? If someone is showing you free pornographic content in 4K quality, you need to get really suspicious about that website. <laughs> and, uh, and so streaming media websites provide a good opportunity because when the, when the visitors visit there, uh, they, they stay there for a long period of time while they're watching the video, and, and all that time gives more money to the crypto jacking people because uh, you know uh, you're crypto jacking for them in the background. So, uh, so, uh, and and if your fans go off or something, you're, you're going to think that oh, it's because of the HD quality video, maybe. So, so yeah, that they provide a good opportunity. So you, so users need to be really wary of uh, of going to uh, these uh, these uh, streaming media websites that serve illegal content. So with that, moving on to IoT crypto jacking real quick. Uh, why do why IoT crypto jacking? Well, the, the real question is not why, it's uh, why not. Okay. So there's there's only two relevant factors here for that they will consider as cyber criminals before IoT crypto jacking. One of them is gaining initial entry. Is it is it difficult to get in? So IoT devices. We just had another talk on IoT devices earlier today, which you know IoT devices are more vulnerable. They don't have the same kind of protection that your average computer does in terms of antivirus solutions and intrusion detection systems and so on. So they, you could argue that they're more vulnerable. Plus, people let the defaults on there. We've seen the case of Mirai botnet and whatnot. So so we know that they can be more vulnerable in computer systems. The second thing that they're concerned about is will it make me money, and if it's worth it, they will do it. So what's the profit potential? So do IoT devices today have enough computation power? Uh, well, that's, that's a very difficult question to answer just because of how different IoT devices can be uh, from each other. So you know, there's all kinds of variations for what kind of processors they have, what we're talking about. So that's a, that's a difficult question to answer, but we'll, we'll attempt it. So, so, so to do this as part of the preliminary analysis, we just took a look around the room and whatever IoT device was available. So for, for for, for reference purposes, I put an, uh, an average user's i7 processor up there that gives you uh, a, a hash rate of 150 on the coinhive.com. If you go and test what the hash rate your computer can produce, then, then that's what it gave us. So that's, use that as a reference point. Then on, on the Amazon Fire Stick TV that I had, it, it gave me a hash rate of 5. On, on my phone, uh, you know, Galaxy S9, I had a hash rate of 25, so that, that's not that bad. And then on my Galaxy Gear S3 smartwatch, it's 0.4, and that's what the where the what the what the, the snapshot is from. So the, the, the and then you, we're not even considering the the routers that have good processors. We're we're not even considering the cameras that have good processors. And then we're not considering a lot of other IoT devices. Where so I think the answer to this is that it definitely is worth it for them if they can get into the right kind of devices, and they'll find a way into those devices one way or the other. So what we need to do is proactively start protecting our IoT devices better because crypto jacking is going to hit them pretty soon. So, uh, so and, and, and then how much money can they make? Now this, again, is a very difficult question to answer, not only because of how, how much there is variations in processing power of IoT devices, but also because the valuation for cryptocurrency changes violently uh, over time. So. This is just, you know, so the, the valuation of Monero, you know, it stayed flat, you know, for many years. And then it shot up, of course, with Bitcoin. And then it started falling down again as, as Bitcoin kind of dove down. And then right now it's about, it's about $100 or so, a little, little over $100. And, uh, and so the real concern right now for us to think about for the future in terms of crypto jacking is clever crypto jacking attacks, not the ones that are using 100% of your CPU so they use, you, you can train your user to try, try to see if, if, your, if your computer is lagging and you know, making the, 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 the CPU fan is making a lot of noise. That's not, the, that's not a real concern. The clever ones are going to stay there for a long term, mining only using 40, 30% of your CPU and go undetected. And then you know, improve. So, you know, and then improved attack vectors, just like any other threat malware, you know, like any other malware, like ransomware, whatever, they'll improve the attack vectors. And then they'll do stealthy mining, you know, using only part of the CPU. And then we can expect to see Google Play and App Store apps that mine in the background, so crypt doing crypto jacking over there. Uh, because, uh, you know, the, the process of vetting these apps you know, there's, there's, there's a lot to be desired there. And, and, and so they will make their way in. And when they make your CPU hot while you're playing a game on your phone, you're going to think that it's probably because of, you know, shitty programming in the game, but could be mining in the background. 
And with, with, with the latest smartphones, it makes sense for them to do that. So, so we're definitely concerned about that. Now, protection against cryptojacking is, is the standard. Is, these are the standard things that people can do, that we can tell people to do, you know, update your computer systems, you know, use antivirus solutions. Actually, while making this presentation, the, the, this power, these PowerPoint slides were deleted twice by my antivirus solution because I put the JavaScript code in there. And so that's good <laughs> that the, uh, the latest antivirus solutions, they're detecting uh, uh, those uh, lines of code as malware, which is basically, and then said it's Java, you know, js.minor routine. So, you know, deleted my files, I had to recover them. But, you know, so antivirus solutions are rec recognizing them. And then we, we, we want to spread user awareness. It's not easy to uh, you know, uh, explain cryptojacking to the average user. Monitor system resources. Your average user wouldn't do this, but you know, uh, it, it's a good way to look at what's going on in your computer. And then install browser extensions that specifically block mining scripts. If you want to go the next level, then use no script. Now nothing works on the internet anymore, but at least they can't execute JavaScript on your computer, right? So, so that's good. Uh, all right, so, so in conclusion, you know, uh, ransomware versus cryptojacking. Uh, well, you know, they're, they're both here to stay. Uh, they're, ransomware is not going anywhere right now, at least. Uh, they're, both, they're both here to stay. Uh, ransomware is more intricate in terms of the crypto API function, all the key management that I was talking about earlier, so it makes it a little harder to do that. But uh, cryptojacking, on the other hand, is relatively straightforward. Once you make your way in, just start mining, right? Uh, no ransom guarantees after infection. The user could just format their computer and start from, from new if they don't care about losing their files. But cryptojacking, uh, crypt, crypt, the, some of the currency that you've generated, some of the value that you've generated is not going anywhere. So, you know, uh, ransomware is known to the average user. It's been many years. It's a known threat. People are aware about it. Uh, cryptojacking is still very new. Uh, noisy ransom notes uh, as opposed to covert long-term mining. And then uh, ransomware is OS dependent. So most of the ransomware that we see, they either work for, you know, the, mostly they work for Windows, but then some go for Apple. And, but, uh, but cryptojacking, especially the one uh, on the web, doesn't matter what, what, as long as you've got a browser, doesn't matter what kind of device you're coming from, or if it's an Apple or Windows computer, you still are cryptojacking. So, so that's, that's another big difference. And with that, you know, what, what I presented today is, is part of what I'm working on and part of what I'm doing. But if you've got an idea for how to improve uh, upon some of these results or how to make the processes more efficient and faster, uh, you know, uh, I, I, would be, I would be glad to hear those ideas. And with that, you know, thank you very much. And we conclude the presentation.